I want to read a passage of scripture to you, one of the Psalms, Psalm 51. Uh, the Psalms, you probably know, are, are part of the, the, the Jewish worship, uh, and many of them, we have no context whatsoever. They're simply a, a psalm of praise or of confession or of brokenness and pain. Um, but the psalm I want to read to you, we know quite a bit about it. And to truly understand this psalm, you need to understand the context that it comes from. And it's a deep context. Uh, we find at the beginning of Psalm 51, to the leader, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Let me explain what that introduction is referring to. King David, the one most known for the, the Psalms, uh, was the greatest king that the Jews ever knew. He was their second king, and he was a great king because he well consolidated the territory and the, the peoples of Israel. But he was also a faithful king. He tried his best to follow God, and uh, in fact, the scriptures refer to him as a man after God's own heart. But that does not mean that David did not make mistakes. And David's biggest mistake was later in his life. Um, he should have been out with his soldiers. They, they, they say in the scriptures that it was the time when kings went out to war. But I guess David got full of himself and said, you know what, I'm the king. I don't need to go out and sleep on the ground and go and um, be involved in the, the activities of war. I'll stay home while the soldiers are out. And while he stays home... He spies a beautiful woman bathing on top of her house. I guess from the palace's view, you can see down on everyone's house. And he's overcome with, with lust for her, this woman Bathsheba, and he sends for her to be brought to the palace. I preached on this in greater depth one, one time and, and made reference to the fact that in our society, we're hearing more and more stories about women abused by men in power. And clearly, this is what we see with David, that as the king, he sleeps with whoever he wants in spite of the fact that she was already married. Well... Things go from bad to worse with David when Bathsheba sends word that she is pregnant with his child. So David has this idea um, to hide what he's done. He, he sends for her husband Uriah, who's a soldier and, and out soldiering. Um, his idea is if he gets Uriah to come home, he'll sleep with his wife and then he'll think the baby is his, just do early instead of someone else's. But Uriah is such an honorable man uh, that he refuses to sleep with his wife. Uh, he sleeps on his doorstep instead um, and says to King David, you know, my fellow soldiers are out there in the, in the, the fields, you know, sleeping. Um, they don't have the comforts of home. It's not right for me to sleep with my wife. And David's plan is dashed. So the next night he gets Uriah drunk. Well, maybe if I do that, that'll have him sleep with his wife. And he's still an honorable man. And things get even worse then. David seals a message and gives it to Uriah and says, take this back with you to the battlefield, to my king Joab. Joab opens that sealed note and inside, David has said, put Uriah at the front of the battle and pull back so that he's killed. It's his way of getting rid of, of Uriah. And that's exactly what happens. David takes his first sin and piles another and another and another on top of it. But things like this can't be hid Joab, the general, knew something was up. Probably the servants knew what was up. And the prophet of the day, his name was, was Nathan. Uh, Nathan hears of it. But Nathan's 
clever. He can't just walk into the king and say, hey, king, you've done something wrong. He, he kind of tricks David a little bit. He goes in and he, and he says, um, king, there's, there's this situation that I've, I've heard about. Um, a really wealthy man, he's got all kinds of, of livestock and everything, um, and there's another man who's so poor, all he has is this one lamb. Well, the rich man took the lamb from the poor man, this beloved, his only lamb, and killed it as a, as a, a meal for a guest. And, and David says, um, tell me who this man is. Clearly, he needs to be punished. And Nathan says, you are the man. And David breaks down, realizing what he had done. He hadn't been able to face it himself, what he had done, but, but standing in front of the pop, prophet Nathan, um, he realizes the depth of his sin. That is the context for Psalm 51. And it, now as, as I read this psalm, think about some of the depth of what David has done. And maybe wrestle a little bit with the words of the, of the psalm as you think about the exercise I asked you to engage in earlier. To wrestle with our own brokenness, our own sin. Because I hope that none of you were writing on your slip of paper that you had done what David had done. Um, but as I sometimes remind us about sin, there's that old image of humanity on one side and God on the other side, and there's a chasm between us. And whether our sin is great or our sin is small, it still separates us. Or in the sense of the chasm, whether you're as absolutely good as you can be and get 95% of the way across the chasm, it's still not far enough. Or when we fail epically like David, none of us is as good and as loving and as perfect as God. Think about all of that then as I read Psalm 51. It starts, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Twice in the first verse, he refers to God's mercy and his need for that mercy and the love that he needs from God. Blot out my transgressions, he says. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. There's that image of cleansing from our, from our sin and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. We don't know if he's referring perhaps to Bathsheba, who he ultimately made his wife, or just the constant reminder of what he had done. Sometimes it's hard to break out of that. He continues, against you, you alone have I sinned. Now, Scholars and theologians and Bible uh, 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 teachers have looked at this and thought, no, um, clearly David is not maybe fully facing the results of what he's done. He's done wrong by Bathsheba in, in uh, what he did to her. Um, he's clearly done wrong by Uriah. Um, he's done wrong by Joab in making him a part of having Uriah killed. And really, he's done wrong by his kingdom as king. He's offended many. Certainly, God first and foremost. But often that happens when we sin in our brokenness. We hurt and damage many others. And done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment, that we recognize that God is right to be frustrated with us. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. The, the reminder that all of us are broken, we're separated, we're not the people we want ourselves to be, and certainly what God wants. When, I, when I'm working with a couple preparing for baptism, um, which is usually a baby, I will say to the couple, I know your infant has not had opportunity to sin, uh, but they will. 
Um, and when they're parents of older children as well, they say, oh yeah, we know it's coming. This is our nature to be disobedient. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. He starts to, to turn. We hear a tone of what, of what David is saying. You know, I, I need cleaning, God, but I need that inside of me as well, in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop. Hyssop was a, a, a bush that was often used in ritual sacrifices, in remembrance of repentance, of turning back to God. And I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. And hear we hear a new spirit in what David says. Create in me a clean heart. I mean, inside of me, give me a new soul. Help me to, to confess and get rid of what it is that I've done, oh God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and Sustain in me a willing spirit. We hear this desire to be removed from what he's done and to, to learn to be a deeper person of faith because of it. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. I will get to share that and help others to grow as well. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. This is an amazing thing that David says. The Jewish faith is based on the idea of sacrificing a, a goat or a, a lamb. But David is saying, no, I realize that what I need is even deeper than that. If I, he says, if I were to give a burnt offering you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. It's something inside of us as we let go of those things that we've done. And we know indeed, as David asked, for God's mercy, for God's forgiveness. What I would ask you to do this evening um, is to, to take the, the remembrances of sin that you jotted down earlier, um, and I would ask you to, to bring them forward and to lay them at the cross in the spirit of Psalm 51, to say, yes, God, I need your mercy, I need your love, I need your forgiveness. I leave these things at the foot of the cross. I invite you to come forward now and do that. It being Ash Wednesday, I thought it appropriate that we turn them to ashes.
There is that remembrance that at the cross, they're gone. That this is why Jesus came, to show us his love. Of course, on Ash Wednesday, we, we remember the ashes. We have the, the ash uh, symbol um, on our foreheads. We remember that we're, we're broken. We're not the people that we're supposed to be. Um, but the ashes are in the sign of a cross, uh, the ultimate reminder of God's love, God's forgiveness, God's generosity in giving us Jesus. Um, and once they burn down a little bit, um, I'll take a little bit of the ashes from our, our destroyed sins, um, and I'll mingle them in our ashes for our foreheads later on this evening. Again, that ultimate reminder of God's love and forgiveness for us. Amen.